We are ladies, leading ladies, and our workshop is about to start. So I have to find the feedback areas around here, make sure I stay away from them. So um, we got the air turned up because it will get hot. Yeah. I'm gonna make sure everybody's comfortable. So good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have a microphone, but I'm not known to be very quiet, as my staff can tell you. Um, my name is Robin Sills. I'm a nurse. I work for Nauta Valley Radiology, and we are very honored to sponsor this workshop today. Um, I want to welcome all of you again, and thank you for spending time with us today. I hope you enjoyed our morning speaker. I think she was fabulous, um, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to Jane Seymour at lunchtime. Um, today is about embracing yourself, and it's about healing from the inside out. And we want to make sure that you take with this group today a little bit more than what you normally do. We take a lot of business stuff with us every time we come to these conferences, but we work every single day. So think about yourself as the day goes on. Think about feeling good about yourself. That's our theme for today. Feel good about yourself, and what you project will come from within. I want to introduce Karen Hines. Karen Hines is a consultant, consultant and author of three books and CEO of the Workplace Success Group. An international company that helps companies propel business performance by teaching employees how to manage themselves and build a professional relationship. Karen has worked with top U.S. organizations such as Verizon, Mellon Financial, and the United Post State Postal Service. She writes a weekly business column for an international newspaper and appear, appears as a guest on radio and television programs in the U.S. and the Caribbean. Karen sits on the board of the Connecticut World Affairs Council and was nominated for the 2005 Woman Entrepreneur of the Year by the Connecticut chapter of the National Association of Women and Business Owners. She is also a member of the National Speakers Association. So we welcome Karen here today. Good morning, ladies. Workshops to have fun. I'm not sure, quite sure about you, but sometimes we do get into this very boring. I'm going to a conference. I need to go to these workshops. This is not the workshop. If you want that, um, let's give a seat to somebody else. I want to have fun. Are we on the same page? Do you want to have fun? Yes. All right. Let me tell you. You heard a lot of introduction of who I am, but I've owned my business now for eight years. If you want to know, what does she know about leading ladies anyway? I mean, that's the first thing when you go, what does the speaker know? Did they read a bunch of books and then they come up here and say, well, let me tell you about what I know about this. <laughs> and I really know a lot because I've read at least 200 books. I'm an expert in the field. No, I'm going to tell you about what I've done in the last eight or nine years, how I started my business, and why I was asked to come here. And then we're going to get into how can we get you to your definition of a leading lady. Now this feedback thing has me really pigeonholed here. I have to stay here. So pardon me, this is not my style. But in 1998, I was working for a company and they, I'm tired of them basically. What happened was, <laughs> oh come on, like you're not working for companies. If you're tired of working for your company, don't put your hand up, please. Because <laughs> somebody in the room might go back and say, ooh, do you know what so-and-so did at that conference? But I was working for a company, and when I got the job, they basically threw me into the job and said, you know, figure it out, and then do a great job. I'm thinking, well, I'm, something's wrong with this picture. Aren't you supposed to train me and tell me what I'm supposed to do? And isn't there some kind of procedure here? And they said, no, you just go in there and figure it out. It was funny that they were telling me to do this because my job was to teach teenagers how to conduct themselves in financial services companies in the inner city of Boston. Now, there's a problem with that. You see, when I got hired for this job, I was very, how should I say, smart, or so I thought. I mean, I went to a school in Brunswick, Maine, called Burden College. And because I went to Belden, I really felt that I had a wonderful education. <laughs> and when they hired me for this job, I was just my three, third or fourth job out of college, I mean, I had a Belden education. Belden is considered one of the liberal arts colleges, the finest in New England and possibly the world. So they hired me, and um, they said they hired me because they wanted a fresh perspective and new ideas. I'm thinking, gosh, I love this company. <laughs> They're going to 
accept my idea. So on my first go around, you know, talking with my supervisor, two months of the job, um, they had a project. And I had one of my fresh ideas, one of those burden ideas they hired me for. And my supervisor disagreed. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You hired me for this. He said, no, 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 we're not going with your idea. And I'm thinking, but the project is going to blow up. Don't you see that? That's why you hired me. And he said, no, we're not going with your idea. Well, I needed to say the project blew up. And because I went to Burden and I had such a wonderful education, I felt it was important to communicate with him how I felt. <laughs> that is one of the problem. See, at Burden, they didn't teach me anything but diplomacy and tact. So I'm from the Caribbean. So I went through with my Caribbean accent. Let me tell you why your project failed and why you and I'm a professional supervisor. I did this in front of about 20 people with cubicles, with you know, everything across the top. I was really smart, wasn't I? But they gave you this job after doing that to teach teenagers how to conduct themselves in financial service companies. Something must have been wrong. I survived. What I did was I really hunkered down because they gave me all the worst projects, all the, everything that was bad I got. But then I had to decide, am I going to sit here and complain about it? Because I got myself in that mess because I was so smart. Or am I going to turn this around? It took me four years. I never got promoted in that job. Never, never put me up for anything. I was just in a corner working. But I knew I was working for me, not for them. Because as I was working, I was learning, not only to teach those teenagers they put me with, but also for myself. And after four years of figuring it out, doing a lot of training, going to classes, doing a number of uh, design courses for myself, and you know, I got some education after that as well, I decided it was time for me to move on. And I quit my job, and I started my company. But I didn't do it just say, oh, well, I quit today. No, I moved on it. And I worked around my schedule, and I turned the passion that I had of speaking into a business. But I kept my day job so I could pay my bills. <laughs> I kept my day job so I could pay my bills. Because often when you come to conferences, you get so excited, and you're thinking, wow, I need to follow my dream. I gotta follow my passion. Don't be broke. <laughs> There's a difference between following your dream and having some common sense. So we want to make sure when you walk out of here today, you exercise both. Yes, you re reawaken and you dust off that dream, but you also apply that dream to some common sense. I wrote my first book in 2000. I wrote the second one in 2002. By 2003, the third one came out. I've been in a number of radio programs and TV programs that were in the United States. In, 19, in 2002, I decided that my business should not just be in the United States. It should be an international business. Now, I had no experience with international business. I had an idea. I figured this is an idea. They say that this is America, you can dream big. So I said, why not take this business internationally? I'm from the Caribbean, why not start in the Caribbean? And that's what I did. I called a few chambers, said, I'm coming down. Could you help me market a few seminars? And I did just that. And that's how my business was launched in the Caribbean. And year after year, I've been going back since then to do seminars there. I tell you this not because I want to tell you a whole litany of my you know, business history, but it starts with a dream. And our topic today is leading ladies, developing the character, mindset, and connections to lead and succeed. But I want to let you know that in order to get to that place, something drastic will have to happen. Something drastic will have to happen to slap you out of your, oh my gosh, I got to go to work, the kids have to be fed, I got Something drastic has to happen, some kind of pain has to be involved, and you as a woman have to be willing to pay the price. Are you ready to pay the price? Because this sounds like a very wonderful, sexy, glamorous topic. But are you ready to pay the price? Are you even ready to try to figure out what the price is? Because oftentimes when you see a lady, leading lady, let's think of, give me a leading lady. Who do you think of a leading lady? Give me an example. Oprah, one. Give me another leading lady. Katie Kirk. Katie Kirk. Another leading lady. One more. Jane Seymour. 
When you see these glamorous figures and you think, wow, look at what they've accomplished, I don't want you to look at that. That's just the vibe, that's just the end product, you see. That's the fancy, you know, makeup version. I want you to look behind the lives of those ladies, and they're no different from you. The difference, the one of the, probably the biggest difference, I would say, between them and you is every time they got knocked down, they got back up. Every time they got knocked down, they got back up. And in each experience that they had where it seemed like, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to make it here, they drew a lesson from it. We're in a society, and tell me if I'm right, you say, if I'm right, say, uh-huh. If I'm right, say, oh, you're so wrong. <laughs> We're in a society that almost celebrates victimization and celebrates when people are doing bad. Am I right? So when we're in hard times, it's almost a badge of honor. Oh gosh, things are really rough. Oh, I'm so sorry. And you get so many people coming to your pity party. I mean, you could have a banquet pity party the way we behave. Oh, the husband's not behaving? No, he's not doing it. The kids aren't doing it? No. The job is really aggravating? Uh-huh. I mean, traffic is bad? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you find yourself getting into that rut? And it's almost, we, we crave it because it's the one time for a lot of us when we actually get some attention. So we don't really want things to go bad in our lives, but when it does go bad, it's an opportunity for us to get a little bit of attention. And there's a deep part of our mind that doesn't want to admit that, but it's like, ooh, I guess I'll talk to somebody today. Ooh. But I want you to break out of that. And it will not happen simply by me saying, Break out of it right now. You came to this conference, you heard this fabulous speaker named Karen Hines speak, and you must break out of it right now. <laughs> Something painful has to happen. But it's what happened during that painful experience that determines if you're going to be a leading lady and if you're going to be setting yourself up for success. Because what often happens when we find challenges is we get kicked down another notch. We survive. But instead, instead of just surviving, I want you to survive and rise. I don't want you to just say, ah, ah, I got through that one. But you're two inches lower than where you were. And the next crisis that comes, ah, ah, oh, I really got through that one. And now you're a foot lower. But you're still above the survival line. And you cannot be a leading lady with that mentality. When you get stumped down, you got to rise back up and say, watch me go two feet higher than I was the last time. And not many of us are willing to do that because we're so busy dressing the wounds. We're so busy talking to people who would listen to our pity party instead of kicking us and say, get out of it. I don't want to hear that. Let's go. You have things to do. Because you are responsible for the people who are going to walk in and out of your life. And you cannot do that if you are walking wounded. So, I want you to think about three business, I'm going to try and find more areas that's not so good from the say so. say so. I want you to think of three business experiences or three professional experiences that were really bad. I mean bad. As in when you were going through them, you would say, oh man, I don't think I can make it, or I really don't like how I feel. Just take a second to think about it. And as you think about it, I then want you to tell me, or tell the person next to you, when you think about that experience, do you think of the pain, or do you think of the lessons learned? Do you think of the pain, and you're still wallowing in the pain, or do you think of the lessons learned, and you are saying, I'm so glad, like a statue today. <laughs> I am so glad that I went through that experience, regardless of how painful it was, because if it wasn't for that experience, I would not have developed this particular characteristic. And nobody wants to do that. Can we be honest? Do you really want to do that? Who wants to say I'm glad for pain? Put your hand up. <laughs> I'm really glad for pain. Please lay it on thick. I really want to grow. Please, I'm begging for it. Nobody wants to do that. But that's what leading ladies have to experience. 
Because in order for you to grow and for you to really make a difference, you cannot be like everybody else. So you have to welcome the pain, as sick as that may sound, you have to welcome the pain, not for the pain, because of what it is carving out in you as a woman, because of what it is doing to your character, and because of what it is doing to your mindset. Because it's either setting you up to fall flat on your face, or it's setting you up to rise. And I don't want you to think, oh, this is one of the motivational stuff, because you will face the pain in about 24 hours when you leave out of here. Some of you have some pain problems waiting for you to leave this conference. As soon as she comes out, she thinks she's motivated, let me show her what she needs to do. So think about three business situations. If you can only think about one, that's fine. And then turn to the person next to you and say, you know what? Don't give them all the sort of details, please. But just turn to the person next to you and say, this is what I experienced, and these are the lessons that I learned. And I will tell you some of my pain as well, because you see the beautiful me up here today. You need to see the me when I'm in my sweats and I'm lying on the floor going, oh gosh, I can't take this anymore. So turn to the person next to you and tell them, one, this is the experience that I had that was really bad, really painful, it rocks my world, or it made me think twice. And then, if you didn't learn anything, please try to think of something you need to learn now from that experience. <laughs> if you're still in the pain mode and it still hurts to talk about it, now is the time to say, how have I become a better person? Go. Why don't you join over here, Donna? There? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think another lesson learned. Don't make me wait all day now. We only 
from, so watch out and come down the aisle now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Doreen. And actually, mine's not a business story, it's a personal story. And I've got that late night call call. And my son, I was in a And the ensuing things that happened over the next couple months were pretty painful. But the cool thing was that I had had another uh, strong event in my life a couple years previously. And in that moment, when I got that phone call, I knew with every cell in my being that I would survive and that actually I'd learned something. You've got to embrace that change. You've got to embrace those challenges because it teaches you at first to build build character. You don't get it sitting alone in your room. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.
because some of you just do this every day. I do. It's fine. I do it too. If you reside in your fears, you will only live in misery. Five, four, three, two, one. Go. If you reside in your fears, you will only live in misery. How many of you live in misery? <laughs> you don't have to put your hand up. Don't worry. <laughs> I say that because when you reside in your fears, women are worry warts. And I refuse to take that title and put it on me. It can go on you. It's not going on me anymore. I've taken that title off and I've put it aside because I have things I need to do with my life. And we're going to talk about how you make those connections and how do you get to succeed. <coughs> but I can't tell you any of that stuff until you get this piece. Until you understand that if you want to be a leading lady, you can't tell me you're too busy for you because you are the leading lady. I am depending upon your knowledge. I am depending upon your savvy. I am depending upon you to be so confident and so full of zest and life that when you walk into my space that you truly <coughs> reflect every essence of leadership. And you can't do that if you run down. Hold on. I didn't get any sleep last night. I'm the leading lady. Oh, the kids were up. I'm a leading lady. Trust me, I am. Don't I sound like it? But I look like a leading lady today. It doesn't work that way. Don't fool yourself. So when you tell me that you're too busy to get up in the morning to take at least 10 minutes for yourself or five minutes for yourself, you are not ready. You are not ready. And some of you are not ready. And you will not be ready after this workshop. Some of you might be. And some of you will take the steps you need to become that leading lady. But until you understand the importance of refueling and taking care of you, you are not ready. No matter how many times you tell me I have big dreams, and you don't know what I was thinking when I was a little kid, I don't care. Because it's a basic principle. Because when we get into a part about how you uh, identify and support allies, and how you deal with detractors, if this piece of your bank account is empty, you're going to crash. And when you crash, it sounds something like this. That emotional woman in the department upstairs had a breakdown yesterday. <laughs> and she's up there screaming and yelling, and she's fussing with everyone and thinks she's the queen. She's not queen. She's a nervous wreck. She's a... That is not what we're about. That is not what we're about. I want you, the next piece, to start to develop your own personal policies and procedures. You cannot be a leading lady until you decide what is governing me. Who is governing me? What are my values? Oh, yeah, we've all been to workshops and values and goals, and it's almost become a generic kind of thing. Do you have goals? Yeah. Do you have values? Yeah. Do you use them? No. <laughs> <laughs> but we get to, I think once you pass 30 or 35, you feel you know everything. I'm past 35, don't worry, I can say this. <laughs> You feel you know everything because you've been around the block, you've been to so many conferences, you've been to so many events that your brain has become immune to half of the information you're hearing. And you hear it, you know it's important, but you don't do it. So I'm going to ask you, since you're also mature and you're also experienced, how many of you have your own personal policies and procedure and you know where they are? You've seen them in the last 24 hours for last week, and you know them by heart. Put your head down. I, I said, can you get some water? My eyes are kind of hurting. I can't see the, the cloudiness in my contact because I'm not seeing any hands. Do you know what your personal policies and procedures are? That's what leading ladies are about. The, re the reason a woman can look confident and sound confident because she knows who she is. Not I'm cute, or not I have a nice suit, or not I know what my goals in life are. She knows what makes her tick. And she knows whenever there's something coming at her that doesn't line up with where she wants to go, she knows to step aside. Because she has a bunch of policies and procedures in place that are there as her constant guide to say, Hello, Teresa. You need to run from that one. <laughs> Teresa, you need to speak up. Oh, we have two Teresas. Oh, we can say, Barbara, come on now. We do not behave that way. Or, Barbara, we do not tolerate people talking to us in that manner or treating us in this way. You need to speak up. One of my personal policies and procedures in my business is I would not tolerate dishonesty. 
You might say, you gotta be kidding me, right, Karen? That's not basic. It's not basic. Because when you're in business, especially as a businesswoman, and for so someone who, um, I tend to think I, I still look really young, you know? I like to think that. But what happens is when I go into business meetings sometimes, I'm often faced with people who uh, look at my youth and look at my size and expect different. I'm not sure. I've heard people say, I was expecting somebody bigger, okay? So, what do you want me to do with that? I mean, this is it. Does that mean somebody a bit taller, you know, have more brains? This is what you're working with. This is what some guy, I was working for a utility company, and I, my session was with a room full of guys. And we had 265 people in training, 260 were guys. And I walked into the room and they heard this woman's coming to the seminar. And they're looking around for the presenter. So I got up and I started talking and they said, that's you? Yeah. This is me. Deal with it. But what, the reason why we need our personal policies and procedure is when we come into situations that challenge us, we have a backbone to rest on. Okay? You have something to rest on and say, uh-oh, hold on now. As I was saying earlier, I was in a situation with some gentlemen. I could not tolerate dishonesty. And... Um, I guess they thought that they could pull the wool over my eyes. And I found out later on down the line that they were doing things that were not in line with my personal policies and procedure. And I had to tell somebody uh, who was twice my age, older than me, older than I was, um, and with more experience, more credibility, more clout, who could literally, you know, cast an eye and half my business get wiped out. I had to stand up for myself and say, no, I will not tolerate that, regardless of who you are and what, who do you think you might be? And it took some practicing. Because I got on the phone with my girlfriend and thinking, okay, here's what's going on. And we went through a rehearsal. All right, you're going to say, um, you know what, I'd like to sever this business relationship because our core values are not in line. And I had to do that. And that was my, was a very small situation. I don't want to give you the gory details of it. But you might be faced with something. What are your policies and procedures? Do you have somebody in your department who constantly come with you and say, Kimberly, could you take care of this for me, please, right now? Or do you have somebody who speaks to you in a way that drives you nuts? They have no respect for you. They have, they don't ask, please and thank you, not even in the vocabulary. Or whenever you're in a meeting, you constantly get shut down. And you don't even know what's going on. And if that's happening, have you dealt with it? And if you haven't, start dealing with it because you need to be a leading lady. Not because you want to be glamorous, not because you want to make tons of money, but because you need to be who you are. And the more you allow people to grind away at your integrity, the more you allow people to grind away at what's important to you, the less invisible you become. So your assignment is to begin to think about three. I won't tell you five or ten because you're not there yet. I wasn't there yet. Think about three things that you would say, you know what? This is how I want to operate. And think of it from this way in the sense that if somebody's doing something around you that bugs you on a daily basis, you need a policy and procedure for that. <laughs> it's that basic. If somebody's doing something to you or they're doing something that really aggravates you, you need a policy and procedure for that. Now here's the trick. It does not mean all the time that you need to go and talk to that person. It could mean that you need to change the way you react to that person. So I'm going to stop for a little while. I'm going to give about 30 seconds or so to think about what are some of the policies and procedures you want in your life. Think about your company's policies and procedures. Anybody know their company's policies and procedures, by the way? Oh my gosh, you want me to memorize? Well, what is wrong with you people? Come on now. <laughs> You need to start thinking, well, what's going to work for you? And this is just the beginning. For those of you who are really going to take this to heart and in a couple of weeks revisit this, you need more than three. But three just to kind of kickstart you and say, come on, let's go. And here's what will happen. If you don't do this now, you will be faced with an even more painful situation. And by the time the situation hits, you will not have anything in your emergency pack to pull out because you didn't do this now. And I would like to avoid some of the pain that you will, I'm not gonna say you might, you will experience. Because when you have a set of guidelines of how to react to something, it makes it a lot easier. 
emergency disaster relief. And everybody talks about what do we do if we have hazmat? What if we do if we have a terror? We are we in a different world. So all the state departments are kind of a contingency plan. If this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. Do you have that? Do you have that? Yeah, who said yes? I heard a yes. Yes, can I hear your emergency plan, please? One of them. <laughs> Anything. One of them is when people tell me I can't do it, I find a way. So you find a way. And, and that is, is that you simple? Too. <laughs> I wouldn't call it stubborn. I like to call it determined. <laughs> because when men are, are, are doing the same thing, we call them um, determined. We call them go-getters. When a woman's doing it, she's stubborn. She's hard-headed. She's a bee. Can we get that straight? So, go. What are some of your policies and procedures? If you can't think of three, start with one. What is one thing you want to put in place to say, you know what? As a result of what I do not like currently, I will do this to change. Or I will ask for this to change. So what is it? One, 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 one of three, whichever you can come up with. Very basic. Don't make it fancy. And if you tell me it's hard, I never said it was going to be easy. Because you need to do this work up front. Something that's going to govern you and how you conduct your life. It could be, your situations could be daily, or it could be, um, you know, every once in a while. One of the things I have for me with my business is one of my policies and procedures. I will never be late for a meeting. And that may sound very basic, but I'm a businesswoman. I need to make sure that I'm there up front all the time. I only have my reputation, nothing else. So one of my personal policies and procedures, I will never be late within my given power. Of course, if I'm stuck at 95, that's a whole different program. <laughs> or 84. But I make sure I, I allot as much time to get to where I need to be. Another policy and procedure of mine, I do not work on Sundays. I don't care how much money you offer me. I don't care how important you are. I do not work on Sundays. Sunday is my family time to put my feet up, and there's something that I have for me. I do this every Sunday, except last Sunday because I went camping. Um, I have a beauty nap. I have a beauty nap. I go, I have my, every Sunday at my house, lunch is served at 12.30. After lunch, I clean the kitchen, and I know it's bad to go to sleep after eat, but that's me. I go to sleep. I do nothing. I don't care about the husband. I don't care about the house. It could be falling apart. My family do not call Karen between the hours of 2 and 4. She's having her beauty nap. I may not look beautiful when I get up, but it's my time. <laughs> so don't bother me on Sunday. Don't call me on Sunday. That's something for me. So what are some of the things you're going to institute in your life? And the world doesn't need to know these rules, but you need to know them. And when you know them, the world will obviously get to know them as well. So think about one or two for yourself. <coughs> Writing, by the way. <laughs> you know, you go to conferences and people just have their pen working like if they're doing something. You're not doing this to me. I know when my crisis hit, where to go. I just want you to know when your crisis hit, what you need to do. that you must understand that important if you want to have a winner's mindset. 
understand that this is a process. You're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, I went to Karen Hines' workshop, she opened my brain, jumped a bunch of wonderful things inside, and now I'm a leading lady. Mm -hmm. And I look at it, and I feel it. It's not going to happen that way. Leading ladies often have battle scars. Leading ladies often have battle scars. But what they do is they take makeup and make those battle scars look beautiful. If you don't have the mental toughness to handle the battle scars, you might not want to consider to aspire to become a leading lady. And I'm being very upfront because not everybody wants to be a leading lady. But you need to know the real picture. Second thing. Don't wait for life to be perfect. Do not wait for life to be perfect. It never will be. It never will be. I'm waiting for this to happen. I'm waiting for someone to come through. I'm waiting for the job. I'm waiting for the house. I'm waiting for the kids. I'm waiting for my boss to behave himself or herself. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Live now. Live in the moment. And live knowing that if you were to die tomorrow, today was your best day. If today is not your best day, what's it worth? Live as if today was your best day. And when I do my presentations, I always say, you will be my best presentation ever. Tomorrow, next week, you will be my best presentation ever. And I need to live like that because every day it needs to be my best. My best needs to get better. Is your best getting better? A winner's mindset. You have to think big and believe in yourself. We've all heard that before. Let me tell you one of my stories about thinking big and believing in myself. When I was in college, I was one little girl. We talked about traveling the world. I wanted to travel the world, but I wanted to do it for free. There's a difference. <laughs> I know I can travel the world. There are planes traveling all the time. Why I pick and hop on? But when I was a teenager, I wanted to travel the world for free. I told my family, and they said, yeah, right. Because I'm my family is a crazy one. They know that. They've come to live with that. So I said, I'm going to travel the world for free. Now, in the description for this workshop, we asked about when you were a little girl, did you dream about really owning it all? Did you dream about doing big things? And I'm telling you this because you need to go back to that place. Because I had to go and visit that Karen, who was 18 and 19, who felt she could travel the world for free. And let me tell you how I did it. I went to Bellevue College, as I told you, my wonderful alma mater. And when I graduated from Bowdoin, right before I graduated, I got a fellowship to travel, um, excuse me, I applied for a fellowship. And the fellowship said, if you could think about anything to do in the world, anywhere, what would you do? I said, I'm from the Caribbean. I will go where it's warm. I went from the Caribbean to Boston to Maine. Hello, <laughs> something's wrong with that. So I get an opportunity to travel anywhere in the world, and they'll give me some money. Where do you think I'm going to go? Warmth. Because in May, there's fall, summer, and mud season. After three and a half mud season, I've had enough. So I applied for this fellowship. I left school a semester early because it was too cold in May. I took classes as well, so I've had enough. And I got my first job out of college. I was excited. They said, Karen, do you have a valid passport? I said, yeah, I do. Why do I have a valid passport? They said, because your first assignment, you're going to Belgium, Holland, Germany, France, and England. Free. <laughs> I'm thinking, I kind of like this. This is wonderful. So then my mother, she goes, what are you doing again? I said, I'm going, my first trip was a business trip, and I'm going to five different European countries, and it's all expenses paid, of course. She said, oh gosh, we can't believe you. So I got off the plane after my trip, and I'm excited because you have to do these trips every year. What a painful thing. <laughs> every year you got to travel for the company to Europe for long periods. Oh my gosh. I got off the plane. I am West Indian, as I've told you, and I see my mother and my sister at Logan Airport. <laughs> Two black women at Logan Airport. <laughs> you got it! You got it! You got it! <laughs> I'm getting off the plane, I'm thinking, oh gosh, they have to belong to me. <laughs> I just walk away, I'm in at Logan. And I tried kind of like, could you guys calm down? We're in the middle of an airport here. And the loud, and the more I try to be, you know, the louder they got. I said, you got it! I said, got what? They said, you got the fellowship. And then I went, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> it's a carnival. Now, to study that music, if the carnival is in February, you can't go in September. You have to go in February. So I schedule eight different carnivals 
for one year, going from island to island. And I was really studying. I really wasn't partying. <laughs> and that was one of my ways where I traveled the world for free. So I did parts of Europe, parts of the Caribbean. I still have Asia to go and Africa. I'll tell you the next time I come back to the conference. <laughs> but in, for you to have a winner's mindset, you have to dream big. Don't dream little dreams, because after you've had kids and after you've worked a few years, your dream size starts diminishing, and you start dreaming smaller dreams, because you now tell me you have this responsibility, and your husfa, and your determination, and your risk-taking diminishes. And you don't think it's, you know, what you used to think was really, really big, it starts shrinking, and by the time you're, you know, 25, 35, 45, 55, by 55 and 65, some people stop dreaming and they're waiting to die. And I'm going to encourage you, at this time is when you need to be gearing up. Because now you have a whole lot of experience behind you. And you're thinking, you know what? With that experience, I know now that people are just people. And everybody has a little facade they show. And you need to decide, am I going to let that facade stop me because their facade seems stronger than mine? Or am I going to push through and say, you know what? This is my time. And my dreams are not going to get smaller as I get older. They're going to get bigger. Because by the time you hit 40 and 50, I am told that you get bolder and wiser. You don't really care what people think. Like, <laughs> that's true. Why does it get smaller? <laughs> Why does it get smaller? So, a winner's mindset, think big. Believe in yourself. You cannot be easily influenced by negative people and situations. And we're going to talk about that. You have to be a goal setter. You really have to see obstacles as opportunities. You have to have a support system. Mine is my family and my strength in my, my, my religious beliefs because that's what keeps me grounded. You need to know what you are because I, I can't tell you what it is. But figure it out and don't tell me you don't believe in anything because you do. Because when we all have pain and we all have sorrow, we turn to our friends or somewhere. So figure out what you believe in and stick to it fast. Uh, take risks. Don't be a little stuck in the mud. I'm 45. I'm 35, I have kids, I have this. Take risks. Because as you said, you don't have another chance to do this again. Understand that fear, and you've heard this before, nothing new, false evidence appearing real. You've all heard this. Now, if you would apply it the next time, you want to pick the phone up and call somebody who you feel is a VP and they have all that much power, and you begin to just sweat and you begin to, oh my God, he's a VP or he's a senior this or she is that. No. False evidence appearing real. That was serious. Conquer that. Be concerned about impression management. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. Show interest in others. We have no issue in that department, do we? Because we're trying to fix everybody's lives. We can't fix our own. And I always make sure that you are the epitome or you're a consummate professional in everything you do. With that said, let's talk about how you identify allies, business allies. Because you're saying, so Karen, we spent almost a whole hour on this piece. Why? Because I want you to get it. Because I'm going to run through this now. Because as I run through this, you're going to understand that the first piece we talk about is critical to your success. My business was built on referrals. I am now beginning to market my business after eight years. That sounds really bad, doesn't it? But you know what? We are natural networkers. And I use my networking power when I started my business to let people know, hey, I'm quitting my job. You want a speaker? Call Karen Hines. You want a speaker over there? I'll come and talk to your conference. I was out there. I talked to all my friends. I talked to my people in my church. I talked to people on the street. I'm a speaker. You want a speaker for your event? Have you spoken before? What well, kind of disorder? <laughs> but you, you have to let people know what you're about. When we talk about how do you identify and get people in your corner, you can't do that if you're not a confident woman. Or I should say, you can attract people who would say they're your allies, but your lack of confidence will determine what kind of people you attract in your life. So we talk about building business alliances. I just met with a, a, a friend, or a colleague of mine, who said, you know what, Karen? Sit down, craft the letter. letter. One page proposal, and I'll introduce you to five of my CEO friends who can bring you into their companies and do training for them. Thinking, do you think I want to do that? Yeah. But how do you get to that place? How do you get to the place where people are going to trust you, believe in you, and want to help you? How do you get to that place? Somebody. Throw an answer. 
Get some audience participation going here. How do you get to that place? How do you do that? That's a fancy word. Building relationships. What does that mean? Integrity, another big word. I'm, I don't like big words. Talking to people, consistency. That, that is what I want you to get to. You cannot build a relationship with someone if you don't want, and you should have them right here. Turn to the next page on your, um, the second page on your, good. Those are the questions that I have there. If you don't want, have a 30 second commercial. How many of you have a 30 second commercial? One hand. How many of you have a 30 second commercial? Put your hand up. Good, give it to me. Stand up. Okay, stop. <laughs> stop, stop. No, 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 stop. See, now you're asking for clarification. <laughs> no, let me explain something. Leading ladies, when they get an opportunity, they fly up. But you're here to learn. You fly up. I just asked, do you have a 30 second commercial? I should have had a bunch of hands flying up in the air and people standing up. Because when you are leading, you don't wait for the rest of Who's standing up? <laughs> is she gonna get up? Is she gonna get up? Is she gonna get up? Oh my gosh, no. Okay, I can No! You don't wait. You just said, I have a 30 second commercial, they wanna hear it. That's how you stand up. Lead doesn't mean you wait for the rest of us to figure out if we're brave enough to put our hand up. Lead means you get out there. 30 second commercial, go. Y'all didn't learn, did you? <laughs> now you're scared. Fair. False evidence appearing real. What's going to happen if you stand up? So stand up, somebody, and tell me your 30 second commercial. Personal or professional? I take it. Thank you. Give Kimberly a round of applause. Yeah. Kimberly, because you were so great, I'm going to give you a complimentary copy of my book, Get Along, Get Ahead 101 Courtesies for the New Workplace. And for those of you who want to learn how to get a copy, <laughs> don't put your hand in. I'm not giving any more. So, there. Go. Let's craft that. Thank you very much, Kimberly. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kimberly. I'm an engineer at, uh, at Yankee Gas. My passion is to tutor students in math. I'm currently looking for opportunities that can help students fall in love with math all over again. Do you know anybody? I mean, you can't go, uh, you know, I'm kind of sort of. This is what I can't, because that's what women do. We've been taught to be very docile and very cute and very not bold. There's no other way to put it. And I'm giving you permission to be bold. Don't wait for other people to give you permission. Take it. One more 30 second commercial. Go. Yes. you're filling a need. You also need to have a system to follow up with new contacts and reconnect with old ones. What kind of system does anybody have? What system do you have now? Anybody have a system? Yes, what's your system? A lead system. You have a whole referral base and you, you just contact those people on a monthly basis. Okay, let me tell you my, one of my systems that I use. I, what I do is when I, meet, when I meet you here today, at the end you all are going to say, Karen, we'd love to have you come for a tour company. You're going to fill it out, and I'm going to say, yes, I'd love to come to your company, too. And I'll call you up, and I'll say, you know, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'll also send you a thank you card. 
thanks for coming to my session. That's all those who give me the email address. <laughs> thanks for coming to my session. It was a pleasure meeting you. And then I have what I have called my Friday morning coffees. On Friday morning, I do not stay in my office. Friday from 9 to 12 or 9 to 2, whatever time, I go out and I meet people. People who I've met in the last couple of sessions, conferences, but I do it every Friday. Some who, let's say they're out of state, I make a phone call, but that's my way. Then when I, when I, after I send my thank you card, I may have had a coffee with you, I put you on a monthly schedule to call you. I don't want anything from you right away. I'm just calling to say, how are you? <laughs> well, I'm saying right away, I'm a businesswoman. Come on now. <laughs> um, I call and say, how are you doing? How are things going? But I also want to know, what can I do for you? What are you doing? What's going on in your life? One guy said, oh, I just had a baby. We sent a card. Congratulations. Because I want to be on the front of your mind. I don't want to be at the person coming. I need business this week because I'm drying it. Could you help me? And that's how a lot of us operate. I want to build a relationship with you. So when anything comes up, you're thinking about me. And I the same for you. Because if I have, I have friends who can come to your financial services workshop, I'm not going to send my friends if you only call me every six months. What do you want now? How do you do my workshop? Do you want to have to send your friends? No, I don't know you. And we do that. Because you met me one time doesn't mean I want to get to know you, or I like you, or I'm going to refer you. Once I get to know you, because people do business with those they know, like, and trust. You all know this. Know, like, and trust. I can't get to know you if I'm only meeting you every six months. I can't trust you because I don't know what happened between January and July. Who knows? Know, like, and trust. Next piece. I want you to be clear about what you want. <coughs> I did not know what I want when I started my business. I am not a business person. I went to Bowdoin College so I could become a lawyer. And when that went out after the first year, I told my mother I was going to be an ambassador. And when after the second year, I decided, no, I don't want to do that either. I said, a politician. By year four, my mother said, you better not waste my money, girl. Figure <laughs> out what you're doing with yourself. I've had so many career changes before I even started working. OK? I, I wasn't clear. When I started my business, I knew I wanted to speak. Well, gee, I can get up and speak in the middle of a circle. Does that mean it's square? Does that mean I'm a speaker? I can do a lot of things. Are you clear? Are you able to articulate to somebody else? And they get it. Because you can say it, but doesn't mean I'm going to get it. And you have to make that connection with people. Because people who are your allies can't help you if they don't know what you're about. And don't think by smiling and shoving a business card in your hand, they're going to get to know you or know what you're about. Because some of your business cards are bad. It says nothing. A name, a phone number, an address. OK. What do I do with that? You gotta get to know people. So one of the things that I do is I have my copies, I put you on my ticker system, so I call you just to say hello, and just get to know you a bit more, figure what your interests are, send you articles if I hear something interesting. I have a golf outing. How many people have you play golf? Women. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> bad, 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 bad. I don't like golf. I don't like golf. I'm gonna be very frank with you. I do not like golf, but I love golf. Not because I love to play the game. <laughs> the first experience I had playing golf was in the island of Montserrat, which is practically non-existent because the volcano is practically decimating that place right now. And a friend of mine invited me. He said, why don't you come over to play golf? I said, are you kidding me? That's a boring game. They're trying to chase a stupid little ball with a stick. <laughs> what is there to that? He said, come anyway. So I went, and I'm out there. And I'm looking at this ball, and I wear glasses. That's a problem. I wear glasses because I'm looking at a ball and I'm seeing people hit their ball. And I can't see where the ball is going. I'm thinking, how am I going to play golf if I can't find my ball? <laughs> so I look down at the ball. I look up where I think I might want it to go. I figure, I'm going to hit one more. So I hit the ball, or I thought I hit the ball. When I look down, the ball is still there. <laughs> he said, well, just try again. Get your stance ready and try again. The ball is still there. Now, not only is the ball still there, but a little hole is right next to the ball. <laughs> so I looked down there. He goes, come on, Karen, you can do this. So I, now it's not a hole, it's a crater. <laughs> so I said, I'm not playing this stupid game. Are you kidding me? I gave up on golf. 
about a year and a half ago or so, and I, I keep getting all these business invitations. Come to a God Valley. Come to see this. I'm like, I don't know. I had my experience. And one of them was offering a clinic. And the clinic was for women or anybody who had no clue about God. And I'm thinking, that would be me. <laughs> that would be me. But I went. And I met a few PGA professionals who sat me down and explained the importance of the game. Now, I knew it was important because all the companies I wanted to get into, the group seminars, they had golf outings. Was Karen going? No. Was Karen can't play. So what I did was, with my business side of the leading woman self, I created my own women's God program for women who are clueless about God. <laughs> <laughs> We've had two sessions already. And I tell you this, yes, I want to promote my seminar, but I'm telling you this because golf is a game where you meet other business people, whether you own a business or you have a career. And they're out there playing and having fun. Now, let's go back. People do business with those they like them. If I'm spending three or four hours with you on the golf course, what do you think of? What do you think of? What do, you, what do I think of you? You must either like you, know, you know me, like me, or trust me. Because I'm out there with you with a ball and it's iron. <laughs> I must trust you. And I have three hours to ride right next to you in a golf cart for three or four hours. And if it's 18 holes, it's longer. <laughs> do you think I'm going to get to know, like, and trust you? But what women do is, I don't know how to play. I, I might not hit the ball. And I'm really bad. And we start that voice in our head saying, we can't do that. And we need to stop that. So we have made it important for women to understand that, look, golf is a business woman's game, period. I don't care about your skill level. Do not play with guys who are competitive and bet for money and who are just really into this. But for next golf season, I am challenging every one of you to pick up the game of golf. Whether you golf with our women's program and you go out there and we do the theory, what are these words? What's a divot? What's a hole in one? What's, and we go through all the terminology. The less you know about golf, the better for us. <laughs> because you need a safe space in which to learn. But you need to pick it up, because if you own your business, half the people you want to meet are out there playing golf. And you are chasing them down with a telephone and email. And they're out there chucking up with their boys. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's go to the golf club. Hello? Can we make this very simple? So, at the end of all, you're all going to sign up for my next session. <laughs> Moving on. Women, when you came in this morning, I shook your hands. I wasn't being nice. You really thought I was being nice, didn't you? Oh, nice speakers coming to shake your hand. I was testing you. I was testing you because leading women know how to present themselves. And it was not a good picture. <laughs> I, you did not come in here for, for, for me to sugarcoat anything. It was not good. Because a language is happening, a conversation is going on with people who are shaking hands. And you missed it, not all of you, a bunch of you. You need to learn how to shake hands because when you go, men are not the enemy, let's get that right, okay? <laughs> but when you shake hands with other women and with men, they are reading you. Do you know the message you're sending with your handshake? Anybody? Confidence. Strength, what else? Confidence. Confidence, what else? Why are you telling me all the positive stuff when I didn't get that today? <laughs> okay, tell me what else you're saying with your handshake. Thank you. <laughs> that fish. Or I get the sexy handshake. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? <laughs> and we're <Robin. laughs> Or we get the... Hi, Dana. It's very really nice to meet you. And I'm not even touching Dana right now because I don't know what she has on her hands. I'm kind of running away from Dana. You know, Dana, you might, you might have something. Ew. Oh, what's that? She happens to have a nice manicure, by the way. <laughs> Good for you, huh? But we need to learn how to shake hands because you're having a conversation and you might say that you're a confident person, but your handshake will deceive you every time. And it's a basic thing, but it's a basic thing that escapes us that often puts us at the bottom of the pile. Because you can't lead anybody if you don't know something as basic as a handshake. When you go into the powerhouses of the world, wherever that may be for you, 
when you put your hand out to somebody, darling, it wasn't you, don't worry. <laughs> you should, can I, can I have a demonstration? Come up here like a confident leading woman. Nothing else. Turn the side here, please. All right, we're gonna go web to web. In case you forgot, hold on. Web to web, this is the web of your hand. The web should lock. Then I'm gonna come around, I'm gonna give one, two pumps, and I'm gonna give her eye contact. Jolene, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Karen Hines, how are you? Good. Now look at me in my eye. Thank you very much. Good darling class. <laughs> and you would say, oh, that's kind of silly basic. But no. If you don't get that basic, you are already falling off the wagon. And you can't talk negotiation. Because they've already read from your handshake that there's a part of you that's timid, that there's a part of you that's unsure of herself, and there's a part of you that doesn't even know what's going on. So when you walk into a room and you give your hand out to somebody, you know that you're communicating right then and there, and an entire conversation has happened because that person's either gonna say, if they're doing one of these numbers to you, they're telling you something a whole lot different. Or if they're trying to squeeze the living life out of your hand, <laughs> they're trying to tell you something different as well. And you have to be, thank you, you have to be savvy to begin to read people's handshake because it's like putting together a piece of puzzle. The first part of the puzzle is about, okay, how did it come off initially? What kind of first impression? And then you can put other pieces together. The second thing I want to go over is the way we dress. We all did not go to charm school, and we all do not need to have designer suits. But as business women, we need to look and put some kind of effort into what we look like on a daily basis. And that goes for everyone. Here's why. When you wake up in the morning, open your closet. I want you to pretend you're going to meet Donald Trump or Oprah Winfrey. Pick out the outfit you and say, oh, gosh, no, I'm never going to wear that. And I want you never to wear those to work again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead serious. If you can't wear it to see Donald Trump or Oprah because these are the people who we hold in high esteem, don't wear it when you're going to business meetings because it reflects badly on you. When I put on my business suit, I feel like more than a million dollars. If I come in here in sweats or I come in here with a hole in my stocking or my skirt is kind of frayed, you're not going to think and seem ugly. But when we get into a rut, we think it's okay, we're in New England. I love my sweaters, I love my sweats, I love those kind of things that keep you warm, my fleece, my wools, I love them. But whenever I go into a business meeting, depending on where I am, I will freeze and look good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure. I freeze, I look good, I conduct my business, and as soon as I get back to my car, I pull out the woolies, I pull out the sweats, <laughs> because I'm playing a game. And if you're playing basketball, there's no rule that say, if you play outside and it's really cold today, that you get to wear sweats over your uniform. You put the uniform out and you won't play. Make sure you put your uniform every day. And that goes from head to bottom. Go get a manicure, get a pedicure, go get some makeup on. Put a little, don't, don't dye the makeup, put a little bit of makeup on. And make sure you're presenting your best self. Because when you have the mindset of a winner, and you have the look of a winner, watch out, world. Okay. Nobody can stop you, okay? Moving right along, we have a few more minutes that we need to go through. When we talk about um, consistency, if you're not consistent, you forget it. If you're not consistent, forget it. Because it doesn't make sense to look great on Monday by Friday, so leave me alone, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> or it's Wednesday, it's hump day, don't bother me right now. <laughs> or you don't know what kind of morning I went through. <laughs> When you're a leading lady, nobody cares what kind of morning you went through, they want you to deliver. Because you always have some kind of morning to go through. Just deliver. Are you ready to deliver? And the last piece is, does your word and your reputation carry any weight in your current circles? Because you can't attract any kind of business allies. If where you are currently, you are absolutely thought of as no other way to put it. <laughs> There's some of us who have great aspirations, but we're not faithful with the little things. Does that make sense? You will meet somebody, you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I want to do this. Yeah, but what are you doing now? Because I'm not here because, um, you know, I called up the folk who said, I'm a great speaker, come and let me come and speak. I'm here because somebody saw me speak, and somebody saw me speak, and they invited me. Now, if I did not 
And actually, the board of audience is very small. They had less than five people. But I went on and I spoke like I was speaking to thousands of people because I don't know whose life I'm going to touch from that five. Okay? You're waiting for the big things. If you are not faithful over the little things, who's going to trust you with the big ones? And that's how you attract allies. Because the people who are my allies right now, they didn't meet me two weeks ago. One guy I met two years ago, three years ago. I have never gotten a piece of paid business from him, but I've been volunteering, I've been helping him, I've been doing a whole bunch of little grungy work. When people are in a jam, guess who's there to bail them out? Karen! Because I'm building a reputation, and you cannot attract quality people to help you until you have proven yourself in the small things. So my challenge to you is, are you faithful over the little things? Because I can't attract any big time business ally or somebody who's gonna give you that fabulous promotion if you think it's a big deal to copy a piece of paper because it's not your job. <laughs> because your reputation is all you have. The education doesn't matter after a while. The reputation is what counts. Now let's talk about detractors. I figure, I like this saying because I thought about it. <laughs> it says, people who distract and frustrate you could be revealing a weakness in your character that needs to be developed. And I only said that because it was true for me. <laughs> this is not about you, this is about me. <laughs> because there was somebody who would just kept grinding and grinding me, and every time I see them, it was, if I had feathers, it would just, and it wouldn't go up in any kind of excitement. It would go up in anger. And this person just seemed to just bring out the worst in me. And it was so bad that when I see them or when I'm around them, my stomach would hurt. And they would just aggravate me. And somebody said, you're going to get an ulcer. And I said, no, I'm not. But why is it you behave that way when that person's around me? Because they drive me nuts. <laughs> and, you know, the lady said to me, she said, um, Karen, you know it's not about that guy, right? I'm saying, what do you mean? Do you know what he's done? Now? And I went on the list of what he's done. She said, you don't love yourself enough. To block him out. So you allow him to get you upset while he's running around oblivious to what's going on with you. In the meantime, I'm getting stomach aches, I'm getting headaches, I'm getting all kind of conniptions in my body. I mean, <laughs> physical. This is only a week ago, trust me. <laughs> this, is, this is not much wisdom here. And, 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 and I sat down and thinking, but they hurt my feelings. You don't get it. And she said, so? She said, look, I've been around for quite a while now. And I've come to recognize that there are always the people who drive you crazy. And there are always people who rub you the wrong way. That's all in how you react to them. That's fine motivational stuff, but we need to talk about my reality right now. <laughs> that is your reality. No, it's not. That is your reality. <laughs> because you hear people <coughs> say, life isn't really about what happens to you, but how you react to it. And at the time, I said, yes, that is so true. Until I was facing this aggravated, frustrating thought that would just drive me nuts. And all of a sudden, it wasn't about how I react to it. It was about him. So the challenge to you is, when we talk about how you deal with people who frustrate you and slow you down, learn that it's about you. And oftentimes, the biggest detractor is you. And if you're not ready to hear that, I'm sorry. But the biggest detractor oftentimes is you. Because who's with you 24-7? <laughs> Even if you have a significant other, they're not with you 24-7. You do have private times, I hope. <laughs> but you are the one who walk around with you every day with your thoughts and your feelings, and you are the one who constantly talk to yourself. And when you are around people who frustrate you and slow you down and aggravate you, if you're not grounded like I talked about the first hour of the session, when these kind of people come into your life, they easily throw you off track. So go back again. If you didn't have any personal policies and procedures, or you didn't think about those mindset and examples, go back and do that now. Because I had to relearn 
as I said last week, that it really is not about the person who's bothering you. If they're physically hurt you, that's a different story. Or they're threatening you, that's a different story. But about how you as an individual decide to react to that person and how you as an individual learn to deal with the number one detractor right here. So I don't have any magic formula for you about how to deal with detractors. All I can tell you is this. Get yourself grounded. Get yourself where you think you need to be about what's going to guide you. So when people who are not in line with you, you flick them away. How many of you, if, if, if you, you, I'm assuming the people in this room here, don't indulge in any kind of hard substances. If somebody were to come to you and say, here, try this, what would you do? You say no, right? You say no, that's not me. Why? Why would you say no, leave me alone, that's not me? I'm curious, but we have our time, let's talk. Why would you tell somebody who comes to you and try to indulge you in some kind of hard substance, why would you tell them no? It's their choice. So why can't it be your choice to let these people who are taking you away from your dream and taking you away from your health, because I told you I had stomach aches <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, to say, no, I will not give you that power over me. It's the same principle. But we only apply it to the really, really bad stuff. And the stuff that we don't think that's there so bad, it's the same. Because a hard substance will kill you. And worry and frustration and stress will kill you, but slower. Okay? So that's how we deal with the tractors. Last piece. In about 10 minutes. The 10 qualities of a great business leader that we talked about. Because we're talking about how do you make these connections. You gotta get the mental piece together. You have to do the thing that's gonna attract allies, the 30 second commercial, presenting yourself well, having a consistent, a consistent plan to make sure you're building relationships with people. And the tractors piece, making sure that you get so grounded that when it happens, it will happen, that you are focused enough to bounce back. And a support system will help you do that. But once you've gotten all, gotten all that in place, I'm just gonna go through this really quickly and I'm gonna open for, discuss, for questions. I want you to think about um, your vision. Are you clear? Are you concise about it? Do you know exactly what it is you want? Because that's what leaders have. They're passionate about their work. And when I say passionate, everybody says passionate. Are you passionate? Yeah, I'm passionate. No. Passion comes from down here deep. Passion comes from every fiber of your soul. When you see something or you want to do something, you are just so into it that you don't know what to do with yourself. It's like you can eat and sleep and dream, whatever it is. That's how passion shows itself. It's not, yeah, I feel like doing it today. I don't know. That's not passion. That's just, I'll do it fine. Okay? So leaders who are good business leaders are passionate. They have a clear vision. And they know what's going on in their organization. For you is, do you know what's going on in your life? Do you know what's going on in your life? Because you have compartments you don't want to deal with. Don't do that. Open up all the compartments. Smell your not. Air them out. Get them all together. So you know what's going on with you before you can go and try and lead somebody. Because half the problem with leaders today, they were never followers. Because everybody wants to be a leader and nobody wants to be a follower. And you have to be able to follow somebody and walk in that person's shoes before you can go lead anybody. But we're so enamored with leadership that we think all of us should be leaders and glamorous too and rich too, not just any kind of leader. <laughs> and you have to learn to be a leader where you are now. With your friends, with your children, with the extended family member, with your community. And you have to set smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time specific. You gotta know that formula by now. But are you doing it? No, let's get to it. Are you capable of making sound decisions? And I got this from entrepreneur.com, the bottom here. It's a QCAT decision-making system. They talk about if you're a good leader, you're able to make decisions quickly, but not hastily. And when you make a decision, commit to it. Don't flip-flop. Women have a tendency of doing that. Oh, yes, oh, no, well, maybe. It's either yes or no. Let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Point blank. That doesn't mean you become rigid, though. It's a fine line. And we have to be analytical about it. 
we have a tendency to overanalyze. And we sit down, well, <laughs> but have you considered? And well, how does so and so feel about it? And then you talk about something. You get con Sometimes we don't have time for that. Cut back on some of the analyzing and you know, pontificating about it. Just make a decision. And if you need to readjust data, readjust. Readjust. But do something. And make sure it's thoughtful. That the people who actually need to be concerned that you've consulted them or you've made a good decision to the best of your ability at that time. And bring people in, because the biggest asset of a leader is your ability to get along with people. I heard a woman said a couple of uh, days ago, you know what, you either like me or you don't. <coughs> okay. And when I'm on, I'm really on. When I'm not, I'm really not. Okay. And, and how, what do I do with that information? But I'm gonna go far. Uh-huh. I'm not sure how far, around the block maybe, but not much further than that. Because you have to be involved with people and their lives and understand that they matter. Because you can't be a leader of one. You can't be a leader all by yourself and say, I am a leader, watch me rise. You need people who are in your corner. And people who understand you and you can connect with them. Because if you're leading, what's going to happen? You have mutiny if you don't take the time to stop and think what goes around you. You have to make sure that you have values and you practice um, open communication. Women out there are part of communication. We talk too much. <laughs> and not only that, but we let everything open for discussion too often. And you have to learn to put it back. I think Lewis Franklin uh, has a book that says, 101 mistakes that women make to sabotage their career. Anybody familiar with that book? Go find that book. It's an awesome little book. I wish I had brought it with me, but it's an awesome book. But it's called 101 Mistakes Women Make to Sabotage. Lois Frank was the name, but look it up. And next you have to make sure that you are a tower of strength in tough times. Tough times means that when stuff begins to look really ugly, get yourself excited because you're coming out on top. And you're saying, are you crazy? No. When the deadline is looming and everybody's running around your office screaming, and going stark crazy, I want you to stop and smile. Because here's what's happening. You're being set up for an opportunity to shine or fall. When stuff is going crazy in your office, are you now prepared to handle the crisis and be the calm, level-headed one who says, here are a couple of suggestions. Or you're going to go, oh my God, they're not the clients are happy. I can't believe this. And you're going to get sucked into all of that. Blah, 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 blah. And how it is so bad. It's really, really bad. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's bad. <laughs> we know that, don't you? Because it sounds good. And everybody knows it's a bad situation. Or you're going to be calm enough and say, yeah, it's bad. And that's not how we can fix it. A good leader has integrity and character. A good leader talks about, we talk about team or you know how to build a good team. And they have a life outside of work. <laughs> they have a life outside of work. That means, yes, you can go play golf with the buddies, but you know what I do? I go get a massage, I go camping, I go do a number of different things without people who look like or smell like or even resemble anything work-oriented. <laughs> because you need an identity besides work. Because when the work leaves, the job goes away, where are you? You are not your job. I am not, this is not who I am. If you see me in the supermarket, you go, oh my gosh, that's her? <laughs> not because I don't, this is what I do. It is my passion. It is my calling. It is what I'm in love with. It's what I want to do with the rest of my life. But I have a life beyond this. Do you? Do you? One of the things that I think all of us need to learn as well is just how to get along with people. When we look at how to make sure that you are in a position to Meet people and talk to them and go back to some of the very, very basics. I'm going to challenge you to do two things. One, to take the time not to get to know people and their personal issues, but to analyze people and personality. We don't do that. We look at what they're doing and their problems and what's going on, how we can fix it. I want you to, don't do that. 
I want you to look at personalities and how you as an individual can begin to analyze people when you meet them. Don't take it at face value. Look at what people say, what they don't say, and what they look like. Because that's going to tell you who they are, not what comes out of their mouth. And we're analytical like that. We just, we've been taught to be social beings. I want you to get analytical. I want you to take the time to get to know people. I want you to go back to the basics. I want you, if you have kids, to begin to teach them these skills, especially young girls. Because young girls have to get this now. So they don't make all the mistakes we all make. It's a cycle. Break it now. And teach your young girls not to be, oh yeah, you're cute, and this was the latest fashion, but how to be a leading teenager. So by the time we get to be our age, in a struggle with half of the stuff we've created for ourselves. Questions? We have about three minutes for questions. Yes? feel about proving myself in a male dominant field over and over again. I, funny you should ask that because I have to do that because of what I'm doing, especially when I'm meeting with men who are making decisions. I don't let it bother me anymore because I can't, I can't do anything about that. What I do is I wake up and say, I'm going to do my best every day. If my best is my best, I can't do anything else. And if they don't like my best, they don't like my best. But I'm going to go out and do my best. And my best is going to be fabulous, trust me. It's going to be fabulous because I don't have any other choice but for it to be fabulous. Um, and you just have to learn that these men are the way they are. These men are the way they are and move on from there. Because you can't change them and it doesn't make sense to waste your time talking or trying to convince them. So do your very best every time and leave the rest up to whatever it is that needs to happen. Because arguing with them is not going to change them. Trying to convince them that your fabulous is not going to try and change them. You can only prove it through your quality of your work. Next question. No other questions? Gosh, you guys, an awesome group. Did I answer every question? You are ready to be leading ladies? Yes. If you have to tone it down, you thought you were dressing really well, you need to tone it down a little bit. Um, dress the way you want to be. If that's going to create conflict in your work uh, environment, take it down a notch, but don't take it to their level completely because you want to be able to move up and out. Because you never know who's looking. I never know who's looking at me. So you need to make sure that that's not the end of the world for your career with that particular job. At least I hope not. But that you always make sure you look clean, cut, and Classy, even if you have to tore it down a little bit. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. How will you find a mentor? First, you have to. Um, I would first ask, depending on what kind of relationships you have, I put it out there. I'm looking for a mentor, one. But I also talk to people who I'm really close to and say, so I'm looking for a mentor. Um, do you have a criteria of what kind of person you're looking for? Do you have a criteria? Because you can't just say, I'm looking for a mentor. I want you to write down what kind of person you're looking for. Then, start going to networking events and seeking out those people. Then you get to know them. You invite them to coffee, invite them to lunch. Coffee's better than lunch, but you don't have a lot of time for lunch anymore. So invite them to coffee, get to know them. Don't ask them to be a mentor or whatever, because that's a scary thing. Just say, would it be okay if I call you occasionally to ask a few questions? If they say yes, you start there. Because that's how I started. I asked, is it okay to call you a few times with questions or comments or anything I might be running around? If they say yes, then after a few weeks or a few months or a few years, I notice that it's developing. Or they might refer me to somebody else. All mine are informal because I've taken the time to get to know the people. That's the hard thing. If your company has a formal program, then you might want to investigate that. But start with the people you know currently. Let them know you're looking for a mentor or what your criteria is. And then you begin to seek those people out yourself by getting to know them little by little. Any other questions? My biggest challenge was me. I'm not gonna, my biggest challenge was me. I was only 28 when I started my business. 
Um, and at the time, I was scared. I mean, scared out of my mind. But scared and quit my job and started a business anyway. And as I went along, I would be nervous to go to the bigger corporations. Now that's not an issue anymore like it was then. Nervous when I meet certain people to talk to them because they were VP or they had this title or they had this connections or when you go to receptions, everybody looks so wonderful and you would. Um, and that was my, my fear of trying to get me to the place where I need to be. Just, Karen, get over yourself. Get out there and ask for what you want. Because I would say, but they didn't give me the position. Oh, well, you know what? Tough nuggets. Move on. Next. <laughs> and that was me. I got stuck in, I didn't get the speaking engagement. And wallowed in my sorrow. Now, I get out there. I do what I need to do. You don't hire me. Fine. Move on. Somebody else will. And it took time to get there. A lot of sleepless nights and crying. And the biggest thing, if I can leave you with nothing else, is, you know, this is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. It won't happen next week. And it won't happen next month. It might not even happen next year. But when you stick with it, you wake up one day and go, hey, I'm not where I used to be. Thank you very much.